Mom. Now, this is what you call a platform with a view. You folks look absolutely fabulous. Um, thanks for being here, and it's going to be an amazing day. Um, Twenty years ago, a study appeared in The Lancet that had the audacity and the ambition to comprehensively quantify death and health loss worldwide from diseases, injuries, and risk factors. Unprecedented in its scope, the global burden of disease not only helps us understand variations in health across populations and geography, but it provides us a blueprint of where to focus to improve health and to eliminate disparities. Today, we celebrate that monumental impact, not to pat ourselves in the back, although there's nothing wrong with that, but because of the people here and around the world who are alive and healthy today because of the global burden disease, because of the work that you have accomplished together. We're here to celebrate them. In 1990, 11 million children under the age of five died around the world. In 2016, that was down to five million, despite population growth. In the last decade, there was a 30% decline in diarrhea diseases, preterm birth, HIV AIDS, and malaria. Now, this isn't due only to global burden of disease, but no doubt, by helping us see health problems more clearly, global burden of disease allows us to focus our limited resources on those factors that matter the most. Understanding global problems and using evidence to build a better world has been the cornerstone of our keynote speaker's vision. Bill Gates brought the spirit of dauntless audacity to his work on behalf of global health. With Melinda, he focused philanthropy on seeking the greatest possible impact. At IHME, the Institute of Health Metrics, and across the University of Washington's Population Health Initiative, we share that commitment to using health evidence to inform decisions that can improve and save lives. As founder and co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Bill Gates has set the standard for expanding opportunity for all people to live healthier, longer lives. Using data to make the greatest difference for real people behind the numbers. They're not just numbers, they are people. In Bill's words, and I'll quote, to turn caring into action, we need to see a problem, find a solution, and deliver impact. That's the core value at my university, the University of Washington, too, and we're proud partners with the Gates Foundation in delivering those impacts here and around the world. The Foundation's simple mantra is, all lives have equal value, and that still remains a radical proposition. Bill and Melinda are working to make it a worldwide belief that not only each of us can help, but that each of us has a responsibility to help. As one of my colleagues likes to say, we're all better off when we're all better off. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Bill Gates. Well, thank you, President Kause, for that great introduction. I'm very excited to be here today and uh, to help celebrate uh, the remarkable work being done by the IHME team. Uh, it's really phenomenal how the GBD is helping us do better in global health. 
My first encounter uh, with the early GBD work is literally what drove Melinda and I to make our commitment to global health. What happened was that uh, uh, in 1993, uh, Chris Murray and a number of uh, the key people who work on the GBD uh, took the 1990 data and had it uh, put together into a World Bank publication called the World Development Report 1993. And it was at the time when I was thinking how uh, should Melinda and I take the success that came from Microsoft and give that back to the world uh, to have the highest impact. And that report showed me the unbelievable inequity in health. It showed me that children in poor countries have a hundred times the chance of dying during their first five years as children in the United States. And so as we dug into that, uh, you know, it was just more and more stunning that more resources weren't going to help in this area. Resources to invent new tools, uh, resources to get the, the tools that we had out there uh, out to these children. A particular example uh, was diarrhea. Uh, the, the World Development R Report uh, showed uh, that there were over uh, 2 million children dying a year of diarrhea. In fact, it was done in DALIs, uh, which are disability-adjusted life years, uh, uh, so that we, they could take all the different disease types and, and, and compare them. But that blew my mind, 2 million kids uh, dying of diarrhea. What was even more amazing was that about half of those deaths uh, were due to rotavirus, a particular pathogen. And in fact, there was a vaccine for that, but it was only being given to the rich children who had almost no risk of dying from rotavirus, and it wasn't being given to the poor children who had a, sub a sig significant risk of dying. In fact, over a million were dying from rotavirus. And so that's the thing that really said to us that there was something missing, an opportunity for us, uh, and that's become, uh, the global health work has become the primary focus uh, of uh, the Gates Foundation. Now that report uh, wasn't nearly uh, detailed enough to help us drive our work in global health. Uh, it was helpful, but the, what the chart looked like is what you see here. Uh, of course, it was three years uh, later uh, uh, than the actual deaths because it took that long to compile the statistics. And it was just diarrhea broken down into three symptoms. It didn't break it down into the things that caused the diarrhea. And it was broken down into very large regions. Uh, there weren't any, other than India and China, there weren't any countries uh, that, that showed up. Well, uh, you know, Chris went on from uh, being part of the team that did this work, uh, went to World Health Organization. He and I first met in 1999, and he brought me a big uh, book of health statistics uh, that represented a, uh, the evolution. And it was fantastic because for the first time, there was actually ranking of countries talking about how they did things. Uh, that was controversial. Chris loves controversy. Uh, and it, you know, countries didn't like being rated very poorly by the organization that they uh, nominally were in control of, but uh, it was a, a huge contribution. And as it, it was as I saw that trajectory of getting the data to be more accurate, to be more timely, uh, to be more specific, that I realized that that would be a key guiding tool, that measurement would be absolutely fundamental for our foundation and all the people who cared about global health to uh, drive deaths down, to improve nutrition, uh, to achieve the goals we wanted. And so it was uh, very exciting when the opportunity came up uh, to get uh, Chris to come here and start uh, the international health metrics and evaluation work uh, as part of the University of Washington. Uh, our foundation jumped at that chance and, and funded that work. And I can say, uh, that the GBD work uh, has delivered on our dream of what we wanted uh, in a very strong way. It's even better than we would have expected, and that's why uh, recently when uh, the sort of 10-year uh, uh, anniversary uh, came up of our funding, uh, we renewed that for another 10 years, and in fact added in a, a lot more activities 
Uh, so GBD could be a fantastic tool. Uh, to show you the comparison, now let's look at uh, what the equivalent today of the, uh, uh, that diarrhea chart is. And so here we see it is by country. You know, each of the countries, even in Africa, uh, where health statistics are, are hard to get. Uh, and it's broken down by cholera, cryptosporidium. And so this is far more actionable data uh, because it's, it's better geography and it's a better cause. This is the data that the diarrhea team at the foundation, a very prestigious team, uh, uses uh, to decide how they take resources and you know, go after typhoid and e-tech and salmonella and all the different uh, remaining pathogens after the big one, which was rotavirus. Uh, the story on rotavirus is a, a fantastic story, and uh, it's best told by using uh, one of the uh, great capabilities of the, the GBD, which is now we can take uh, and see, things how, see how things change over time. Uh, you know, because now we, we get it at these uh, a very detailed level. Uh, this is a chart uh, that actually shows the reduction uh, in rotavirus deaths uh, going between 2006 and 2016. And that's a very important period because that's when we finally uh, got the rotavirus vaccine to be so inexpensive and by creating uh, the Global Alliance for Vaccines, by making volume guarantees and bringing in new manufacturers, by working with each of the countries, uh, over that time period, uh, virtually all the children in Africa, which is where vaccines uh, show up last, are now getting uh, modulo the, the coverage level, they are getting this rose virus vaccine. And so seeing that dramatic change where the deaths have gone down uh, very dramatically is kind of a report card uh, on that investment. Uh, and, you know, with something like that, uh, we're actually saving lives for less than $1,000 spent, you are saving a child's life. So this is one of the great miracles of uh, global health. Uh, is what's gone on with diarrhea. And having this kind of information, uh, there's a great collaboration between uh, the foundation and GBD to, uh, to make this even better. So the, um, you know, this is a, a very powerful tool. Uh, and by getting people to use uh, one location, you know, everybody, the country people, the UN people, the donors, and we're all looking and seeing the same trends. Now, sometimes there'll be disagreements, uh, there'll be error bars, but it's great to have that all represented in a, a tool where you can go back and look at the source data, uh, you can change the assumptions. Uh, the, the dialogues are far more robust today. You know, even things like you know, malaria deaths, where they are, what age they are, uh, are now played out as people look at these figures and say, hey, we need to do a study uh, to eliminate the uncertainty in, in different areas. The foundation literally takes uh, the, the death burden, the, the disability burden, and uses that to prioritize our work. After all, you know, if you believe that all lives have equal value, uh, you want to go after, uh, you know, with finite resources, go after the things that you can uh, uh, have the most impact on. And, uh, you know, so our disease groups, uh, literally the way we budget those, the way we look at, at that future is driven by uh, wanting to get uh, uh, these, uh, these numbers to improve. Uh, and so it's our measurement system, it's our, our feedback system. One thing that's very interesting is that, of course, we came into this with a big focus on developing countries, uh, where the health system data was very weak and you had to go back and do surveys. Uh, the administrative data in those days uh, was very unreliable because uh, it wasn't tracked very well. Uh, and even knowing the population numbers uh, in uh, various locations, uh, that was a, a huge source of error. What's one thing that's very impressive to me is that the GBD has emerged not only as a great tool for developing countries to understand what's going on with health, but also for middle income and rich countries. Uh, by being normative across the globe, 
uh, by showing such important trends, in ter including the rise of chronic diseases, uh, this is an instrument that can be helpful for all governments, not just the, the ones that our foundation focus on, focuses on. In fact, it's a very key thing. Uh, you know, the other area our foundation works in is education. And you know, what we see there is that government budgets, uh, as they're spent increasingly on health care, is making it harder and harder to have the resources we need for education. So you could literally say rich world health and, and getting that on the right trajectory and efficiency is very important uh, for uh, that education work. And so health costs uh, and understanding what's going on with health is critical to literally 100% uh, percent of the, uh, the work we do. Now, when we talk about the GBD, uh, I'm sure a lot of people do this, but I want to be careful uh, to give credit also uh, to the people who are out in the field gathering this data, the people who fund uh, the surveys, the trials, all the different activity uh, that rolls up here. Uh, the GBD is a miraculous uh, tool, but in some ways you can think of it almost like a Google or a Bing, where it's uh, taking that information and putting it into an easy-to-understand format. Uh, the fact is you've got to have that information. You've got to go out and you know, survey those mothers and ask about those deaths and, and do those trials. Uh, so it really is bringing together uh, the information from uh, the whole global health uh, endeavor. The, the future here is, you know, pretty clear. We want to uh, take uh, the error bars, the accuracy, and make it better. Uh, we want to take the uh, latency, the amount of time, uh, and make that shorter. We want to take the geographic resolution uh, and make that uh, smaller and smaller, uh, moving beyond uh, the country level that things have been done in the past. And we want to coordinate better with countries. We want their administrative systems, the way they actually track and run things and the way we gather this data, to be synergistic to each other. Uh, and those are our challenging goals. One of our big diseases uh, is malaria. And here's the classic uh, malaria map. Uh, and what you see is a number of countries, those in uh, dark red in particular, have very high malarial burdens. And it's very helpful uh, to have that uh, on a country basis. But when you're actually going in, as we are now, and trying to do local eradications of malaria to reduce this map, uh, in fact, to start moving down from the north and moving up from the south, uh, so that over the next 10 years, uh, we can reduce the malaria map, ideally uh, to half the size it is today. We need to know where to focus resources, not just at a country level, but a, in a specific location. Uh, and so working with uh, GBD, one of the great things now is uh, taking this data down uh, to five kilometer by five kilometer uh, type maps. And you can see when you do it that way, uh, it's, it's utterly different. Uh, in fact, if we go and zoom in on a, a particular country, uh, which is Zambia, uh, uh, there, you can see there's large parts of the country, and a lot of this has to do with uh, altitude, which affects the mosquito species that are able to survive there. Uh, you can see there's large parts of the country where you don't have to intervene much at all. Uh, you can see where you have a lake there, uh, you have very intense malaria transmission around that because uh, the men go out to fish during the day and they're actually uh, being bitten. And so even bed nets aren't good enough there. So, you know, not just getting at the numbers, but understanding the local ecology will be absolutely uh, key uh, to do this uh, reduction of the malaria map, which over time, you know, the goal is that ultimate goal for diseases is to achieve what was done for smallpox, uh, to achieve what we're very close to having uh, for polio, uh, which is eradication. Uh, and it won't be easy. The amount of information flow uh, about what's going on with the disease uh, that we're going to have uh, to get to achieve malaria, even over a 20-year uh, a period, will be uh, quite phenomenal. Uh, when we talk about the data today, uh, we still have some areas uh, that are challenging, <coughs> like diarrhea was. Uh, for example, take uh, the death of children during their first 30 days, uh, neonates. That in many countries, any country where you don't have a big malaria burden, is now over half of the deaths of children under five. So it's kind of amazing 
you know, of all those months you live up to, to age five, uh, the first month uh, is half the deaths, and the first day uh, is almost half of those deaths. And so really getting in and saying, okay, what is, what can we do to prevent that death is very key. Well, today, just like we used to have just runny diarrhea or bloody diarrhea, today we have asphyxia uh, and sepsis are the two biggest causes there. And that doesn't really guide us to what we need to do. Uh, and so we're going out <coughs> and actually having to gather primary data uh, by doing what's called a minimally invasive autopsy uh, of young children in developing countries. Uh, when we first talked about that, people weren't sure there'd be permission and, you know, how do you uh, get the skills to do it to make sure that uh, uh, it will be reasonable. But a lot of creativity has gone into that. And so the data that will be fed into GBD in the future won't just be asphyxia uh, or uh, sepsis. It'll be things like RSV or CMV and uh, really drive us uh, that, uh, you know, we can get uh, the action steps uh, to drive those deaths down. Uh, the, you know, I really want to emphasize this partnership with countries uh, in helping them uh, so that their data systems are, are literally letting them make decisions like, you know, we don't have enough staff at a primary health care, or our performance in our supply chain is, is not good enough. Uh, just knowing the global statistics is very important, but <coughs> mapping this down to local uh, performance of the primary health care system uh, is important. And that's where the resolution in time, the resolution in space, and the partnerships uh, with those countries are so key. Ethiopia is one where we're really pioneering this idea that the global data system and the country data system really should be uh, one data system working together with the greatest efficiencies. Uh, duplicating data systems, which this field had a huge history of, GBD has done a lot to bring that down, uh, but particularly when we look at country level systems uh, or even how donors come in and often create separate systems, we still have a lot of work we can do uh, to bring these things uh, together. Now, one of the things we did recently <coughs> with GBD uh, is kind of an amazing thing, which is forecasting. Of course, you can't perfectly forecast. Uh, uh, there's so many different variables in terms of instability or medical innovation or quality uh, of execution or uh, you know, mosquito populations because of the weather. But still, you, you can largely show the likely path uh, that things are on. And so we turned uh, to IHME, uh, the foundation didn't say, we need to go out to the world and show what's at risk if the world loses its focus on global health. And of course, that's particularly timely because uh, there was a proposal from the United States executive branch to dramatically cut the spending on global health. And we wanted to show that the improvement, which is miraculous and has taken place, really is at risk. Uh, and so we uh, sat down with Chris and his team, did a lot of work, and came up with 18 different indicators where we actually showed if you keep funding up, if you have innovation, if the countries that do it the best uh, rub off on the countries who execute uh, the worst, what is at risk in terms of that funding and, and focus? Uh, and so we took what I've often called uh, my favorite chart of all time, uh, which is that uh, chart <laughs> that shows uh, the phenomenal uh, reduction in yearly under five deaths. And we took and we uh, showed going from <coughs> today uh, to 2030, uh, what would that difference be? And this was very powerful for people. I think the two charts that really got people's attention the most out of the 18, although I liked all 18 of them, uh, were the HIV chart that showed specifically if the funding cuts had been proposed were brought through, that you'd lose an additional five million lives uh, to HIV because that's a uh, uh, infectious disease that, like all infectious diseases, it has a tendency to either grow or, or shrink depending on how powerful your intervention is. And it's still, particularly with the population growth in Africa of young people, uh, it, it actually can still grow if we don't maintain our treatment focus and get eventually a vaccine and other uh, tools, perhaps even a cure, 
uh, that would make a huge difference there. Here we see the history, 1990 uh, to 2016, as uh, President Kausi said, uh, it's, it's phenomenal. This is vaccines, economic development, you know, all these great things at work. You know, it's one of the things the world should celebrate the most. And so what we are, we're down to 38 uh, deaths uh, per 1,000 uh, births. You know, pretty, pretty phenomenal. Uh, what this chart shows is that if you don't do a good job in spreading best practices and funding, you only get down to 31. So it, it will continue to improve. Here we didn't take a di dire example of assuming civil war broke out uh, or that huge drug resistance broke out. But the improvements uh, largely uh, go flat on you. Whereas if you get new v vaccines out, if you get coverage there, if, if you fund those things, uh, then it goes down uh, to 19. And so, you know, we're all, uh, you know, we all, everybody here probably has a little bit of a mathematical background, otherwise you might not come to this thing. Uh, and the area under that curve between the, the red and green there, that's 20 million lives. And, you know, Stalin said that, uh, you know, one life being lost is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. So, you know, is that a statistic or not? It's 20 million lives. You know, I think everybody here would probably agree it's 20 million tragedies. And so by using GBD, uh, understanding where we're going year by year and course correcting, uh, that gives us uh, the best chance of, of saving those 20 million lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. That was absolutely fantastic. I think you've illustrated like nobody um, could, given your own record of uh, taking this data, acting on that, funding the effort, and then actually guiding your uh, major uh, philanthropic effort according to this uh, framework. I, I think that was an incredible statement about what we are celebrating today. You know, um, as we look back in the, the, on these 20 years, or a little bit more, 1993 as, as, as uh, first publication of using DALIS, we see that the GBD really enabled a number of critical transitions from a focus on processes to outcomes, to health outcomes, to what actually happens, from looking only at mortality, a premature death, which is very important, to also adding losses of health due to non-fatal outcomes. Um, and then a very important thing that you mentioned, the, the ability to compare across disease categories, across geographies, and across time, and both look at trends, but also project and forecast. And then finally, I think GBD really enabled a movement towards evidence-based policy, and particularly priority <laughs> setting based on, on evidence, as opposed to other political or economic interests that might have driven and that still drive uh, priority setting. So I, I wanted to ask you, um, I mean, unfortunately, not all decision makers allocating resources in the world are Bill and Melinda Gates and have uh, that mindset that you have. GBD has been fantastic on the supply side of providing a scientifically based a series of ingredients for policy making. H how do we act on the demand side, on all of those people who are making resource allocation decisions, which will eventually drive those outcomes, to, to actually <coughs> embrace this and be held accountable according to this framework? How do we strengthen the demand side from ministers of health, from uh, you know, private entities across the world as the Gates Foundation? How do we make every minister of health work and allocate resources as <laughs> your foundation does? Well, of course, uh, ministers of health are often uh, on our side. We also have to get the minister of finance and the, the leader of the country uh, engaged. And that's partly why uh, GBD is moving a little bit into the financing side to kind of look at resources. It's a very complicated area, but you know, there's more being done to try to get that into the numbers. One thing that I was really stunned by uh, was that the relative performance 
of different countries' health systems. And, you know, Chris showed that in his, uh, the 1999 uh, WHO document he did. There are some very poor countries who run fantastic health systems. Right. And so if you take the finite dollars and you have good execution, you know, and you take things like vaccines and antibiotics, safe delivery, focus there, you can actually achieve uh, great results. And so, you know, I'm often, when I'm meeting with heads of countries or ministers of finance, I'm taking that relative comparison and saying, here's countries you think of as your peers. Uh, even here's a few that are poorer than you. And here's how they do so much better in their child to death, vaccine coverage, uh, delivery. And I have to say, it's one of the few mechanisms, that notion of competition. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you're going to an Indian state, show them the other Indian states that do better than them. Uh, in Africa, you know, understand who they, they think of as their peers. So GBD lets us take somebody who's not in the health domain and quickly glance and say, wow, we should be able to do better. Uh, and, and so it has been a powerful tool. And it's, as aid donors have been, you know, dealing with the financial crisis and considering cuts, the fact that the health system can come back in and say, here's the outcomes, that uh, has, has been huge. Uh, you know, it, the, the UK, when they were cutting the budget, uh, it was the right-wing government under David Cameron. Mm -hmm. They were cutting everything. Well, they didn't cut foreign aid, partly because they could go and talk about all the, the lives that have been saved. And so without this data, uh, the global health endeavor would not be, uh, in terms of excellence and overall uh, funding, wouldn't be anywhere near where it is today. Thank you. In a minute, <coughs> we're going to open it up for questions. Um, uh, so, and there'll be staff members of the HME with, with microphones uh, to, to recognize you. But while you, the audience gets ready, l let me ask you uh, another thing. I mean, this journey has been amazing, uh, 20 or a bit more years. You know, you had these two pioneers, Chris Mary and Alan Lopez, working away. They then brought a very distinguished group. Many of them are here today, the original members of the, of the first GBD project, uh, the Lancet took a chance in publishing the first four papers to, uh, 20 years ago. And Richard Horton is still the editor, and uh, I, I think probably there's some relationship in his success as an editor uh, uh, in, in, in publishing this kind of pioneering work. Today you see 2,700 collaborators across more than 130 countries. I mean, it's an amazing, the, 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 the enterprise itself is just huge. You pointed out, I think, very interestingly, uh, areas for, for future uh, growth, reducing the latency period and the uncertainties and uh, the geographic resolution and uh, the, the partnership with countries. Do you see any areas of work, uh, any additional areas where, where uh, that work should be focusing, anything that's missing in the current effort that should guide the next 20 years of, of GBD? Well, there's still so many great mysteries uh, in global health. Uh, the whole area of nutrition, which actually the daily burden we have in Africa, the effect on lives of the children who survive, which of course is a very high percentage now, uh, the impact on their uh, physical and mental development where they're not able uh, to go to school effectively and you know, live a, a productive life. That is one of the great, you know, mysteries. If I had just one question I got to ask the genie, I'd ask, hey, come on, how are we going to uh, solve nutrition? Now, there's, you know, understanding the microbiome and lots of things. Uh, we're on track there. But there's lots of survey data and information uh, that, that will be key to that. Um, you know, there's other mysteries, like uh, we have ARV medicines. Why... Do we still have 1.6 million deaths in HIV? What is it about the local performance? People who never seek care, people who have interrupted care, people who have developed resistance. The performance of that system in terms of really taking the exemplars and spreading them around, it's not nearly as good as it needs to be. And so uh, we have to take GBD and you know, get the resolution. We'll have to get a little bit of financial data in there to. Uh, to understand these efficiencies and try and get at what's going on uh, that 
still allows that, that number to be so large. And, you know, there's all sorts of things. The GBD actually, you know, in some cases when you see an error bar, you say, okay, we should fund a study on that. You know, take, uh, you know, indoor smoke and how, what effect that has on pneumonia. You know, you still have huge disagreements. Uh, and so GBD should be the place where you say, okay, we've got this disagreement, let's go fund, uh, fund this study and, and get these things done. So whether it's quality of execution or, or still some uh, mysteries of, of biology, uh, like the neonate deaths, you know, the GBD will be part of that way that we, we go and discover it and then we show people and then essentially that challenges people to execute on, on the intervention. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a few moments for um, questions from the audience. If um, uh, any, anyone would, would uh, like, I see several hands. Um, and I would just ask you to please limit your questions to about a minute because I anticipate that once we get the first few questions, there's going to be a lot of demand. So please, uh, and make sure you actually ask a question. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Suda Jairam, and surgery, uh, surgeon from Virginia Commonwealth uh, University. Um, my question is really, uh, how do you envision changing the strategy from a largely disease-specific intervention that has guided our communicable disease management over the last decade to something that builds more health system capacity and allows non-communicable diseases and injuries to be addressed more effectively going forward. Thank you. Um, well, certainly GBD, I think, uh, has illustrated this shift in disease burden in the rich and middle-income countries in a very dramatic way. And, you know, the DALI concept, which goes back to those early days, is to try and capture not just deaths. Uh, you know, infectious disease is mostly about deaths, not entirely. You know, malnutrition is all 100% uh, about DALIs. There is a huge challenge coming, and, you know, some of the countries we work in, like India and South Africa, uh, are fascinating because they have both the remaining challenge of infectious disease, and they already have a little bit of what the rich world has, which is uh, uh, diabetes, obesity, uh, neurological, including Alzheimer's. And so all of these performance issues about how do you tier those patients, provide the intense care to those who really need it, uh, provide uh, uh, modest care to those who don't, that's one of, been one of the breakthroughs in the HIV field. You know, in HIV, we've had flat funding uh, for almost a decade now, and yet when you keep people alive, the total number of people surviving with HIV goes up. You know, so we've gone, starting with six million now, 36 million, and so our cost per treatment per patient, we have to innovate in that to let that flat funding still let us <clears throat> get the treatment done. And that's where these uh, peer patient groups, tiering of patients to those who are very compliant, and you just take a dried blood spot and get a viral load out of it. And so some of that innovation that people like the Western Cape and, and South Africa have done really well, Malawi, because of limited resources, did very well with the MSF group there. Those are techniques that are going to be uh, very important. And the place I think we'll see the most innovation is the middle-income countries, because they are less rigid in terms of adopting new practices. And the economic pressure on them to not run health systems the same way the United States has, they just can't even, uh, you know, they could not uh, uh, afford to do it. And so they will be, in terms of new diagnostics and new tools, new practices, uh, I think you'll see a lot of uh, the, the willingness to try to do things in new ways will be in middle income. And certainly the poor countries will watch that and benefit from that, and maybe the rich countries as well. Great. <clears throat> Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Ali Akanda from the University of Rhode Island. Uh, some of the figures you show, um, like malaria, rotavirus, cholera, so uh, all of these diseases ha are heavily influenced by changes in the environment, such as like climate, weather, and also water cycle variables, droughts, floods, things like that. And our ability to observe these variables have drastically improved over the last decade or 
two decades from satellites and other data sets. Do you see a convergence of these huge data sets of monitoring these environmental variables and our estimates of disease burden and uh, ability to guide the forecast and the prevention policies? Thank you. Yeah, there's um, a really strong relationship between IHME and another group uh, that I fund called the Institute for Disease Modeling. Uh, so IDM, those are a lot of ex-physicists who understand uh, stochastic models. Uh, and so they've been very key as we take, uh, for it's exactly as you say, your point's a very good one. As you take and model malaria, you need to understand weather patterns and entomology. You need to go in and, and we get the mobile phone data to see where people are moving. Uh, so, for example, we want to draw a boundary in the southern part of Africa to get rid of malaria, but we have to understand how much our reinfection risk we're going to have if we, you know, get rid of it in a certain southern part. You know, do people in Swaziland go in and up to Mozambique a lot? So if you draw the line in between there, you're going to get huge reinfection. And, you know, you've got uh, uh, Namibia, and, uh, not Nambia. Namibia and uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, Angola, where you have a lot of malaria that's going across the border there. And so we need very sophisticated models. And in fact, having that modeling group has been very key for the end game, what we think is the end game of the polio eradication, where we're taking the genetic data. Uh, we're taking the history of risk, taking sanitation samples, and deciding how to take our finite resources and really go after the three remaining hotspots, which are Pakistan, Afghanistan. Uh, we have an outbreak in Syria, unfortunately, right where ISIS uh, is, and then still in northern, uh, northeastern Nigeria, where Boko Haram is. And so the statistical data sets, including the forecasting, and then the more symbolic approach, which is this disease modeling, those two are very complementary, and so those two organizations spend a lot of time together and will be key uh, for uh, all of the, uh, those uh, vector transmitted diseases in particular. Um, Richard Horton from The Lancet, and um, it's, uh, it's, it's truly wonderful to be here and celebrate this 20th, 20th anniversary, but, but one of the themes that came out in yesterday's discussions, um, I think, was that we could all do so much more to translate the global burden of disease into more effective political action. So my question um, to you is, should the global burden of diseases goal to be the be to be the chief accountant and actuary of global health or should the global burden of disease and indeed your foundation move more into being the chief activist and advocate for global health learning some of the lessons from the phenomenal aids movement which was so effective in going from data to political action. Thank you. Well, we have a history of uh, people who are, have been global health activists, people like Bill Fahey, uh, who is profound in so many things in global health, including uh, the smallpox eradication. Uh, uh, he and D.E. Henderson, you know, are, are heroes of that. We have people like Jim Grant, who when he ran UNICEF uh, actually got people to pay attention to vaccine coverage rates uh, and got them up from about 20% to 70%, uh, the old EPI antigens. You know, arguably he, he may have saved more lives uh, than anyone in history. Uh, or you can take Morris Hildebrand, the, the guy who made the vaccines at Merck. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of good candidates. So we should all draw huge inspiration from these activists who got out there and, you know, took things like, you know, WHO didn't want to do smallpox eradication. They had seen malaria eradication fail and, you know, those few people had the optimism and uh, the backing of USCDC uh, to go out and perform 
one of the, the great m miracles of, of, of human endeavor. Today, this is you know, particularly important as countries are considering turning inward, and all these aid budgets are at risk. The U.S. Uh, is the most prominent of those because it's the largest aid budget, and there was a, a particular uh, uh, effort to cut it, which fortunately, it looks like the Congress won't go along with that, and in that particular issue, uh, fortunately, they have, have the final say. So, you know, certainly, I, I hope I'd be the first one to say that if GBD uh, as a group, you know, all of us here who uh, look at the GBD, if it inspires us to be more active in going to political leaders in rich countries of how they uh, donate, going to uh, political leaders of these developing countries and talking to them about uh, how they prioritize their health care, you know, that basically describes my current job. Uh, and, you know, <laughs> I do my best and the GBD empowers me uh, to do my best, but we need you know, everybody here to be uh, deeply in, engaged in the endeavor. The GBD, of course, is this beautiful thing, but if it's just going to document, you know, deaths, no, I, I don't think any of us are going to be satisfied with that. We need it to drive the actions, and that's where the resolution in time and space and, uh, you know, symptom, you know, just having that asphyxia number, you know, if it stays just asphyxia, that won't let us do, go do our job. And so, the entire evolution and the very tight relationship that GBD has with our foundation and increasingly with WHO is about making it actionable data. A quick follow-up on, on, on this theme. I mean, you've been very prominent in the last few weeks on U.S. media, for sure, trying to revert some decisions that would be catastrophic for millions of people and for the world. You know, in this era, you just mentioned inward-looking, um, but also a disturbing uh, world of alternative facts, of doubting science systematically, which is exactly the opposite of what we're talking about here. It's using science to drive policy. Are, are you getting that traction with your very, very visible leadership and the credibility that comes from the fact that you literally have put your money where, 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 where your thought is? Are you getting in, in, in a world of skepticism and doubting of expertise uh, the traction that we need to make sure that those disastrous decisions in resource allocation don't happen? Well, the, it, there is an irony that at a time when the tools of diagnosis and genetics are, you know, advancing at this phenomenal rate. I spent uh, uh, Monday this week going through, uh, you know, some really breakthrough tools uh, that will help us uh, diagnose things, even in, in poor world conditions. So the amount of data, the amount of facts, real facts that we're generating to uh, you know, understand the biology, understand the intervention, how they're working. The irony is that at the time where science uh, is, is really helping us you know, in hunger and disease over the next 30 or 40 years, we will have conquered most, we will have achieved most of the ambitious goals that we set. That it's a time where in the public dialogue, uh, you know, the, the acceptance of facts is, is weaker uh, or are confused. I hope there'll be a backlash to that because, you know, the benefits of this scientific work, in which GBD is an a incredible example, that you, you see what's going wrong. You see, hey, drug deaths are going up. Uh, uh, you know, this is very troubling. You know, let's get it at the phenomena that's involved there. Uh, you know, it, it can be so valuable. So science is about to enter its most exciting period ever. And, you know, I certainly am a voice that says we should pay attention to that. That's great. Um, we have one more question. Yes? Okay. Yes, uh, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gates, for your contribution to reducing childhood mortality worldwide. Uh, I'm the past president of the World Heart Federation in Canada and India. Cardiovascular disease is the biggest burden in the world. 80% of it of it occurs in low and middle income countries. In rich countries, we've reduced cardiovascular disease mortality by 75% in the last 40 years, but it's increasing in the poorer countries. What do you think can be done, and especially do you think it could be part of the agenda of your foundation? Yeah, so uh, 
cardiovascular disease, you're absolutely right, uh, is, is a tragedy. And historically, you know, it hasn't been a uh, big focus for our foundation because we saw that with vaccines, until we could get a decent job done with vaccines, like getting rotavirus out, getting pneumococcus out, uh, driving the invention of a malaria, TB, and HIV vaccine, that in terms of equity, that's where, that no one else was going to fund that stuff. Uh, and uh, so we, uh, along with some governments, uh, needed to very much focus there. What's been come clear in heart disease is there are some things like controlling blood pressure, uh, where the drugs are now generic and extremely cheap, uh, that you ought to be able to have the same sort of miraculous uh, uh, benefit where by spending you know, less than a few thousand dollars you can uh, save many, many years of life. Uh, heart disease has gotten now into the category of, of miracle things. Now it took the rich world inventing these drugs and you know, making them cheaply and seeing how they worked, but you know, the time is that, uh, that this should be used. And so there were three foundations uh, that recently funded Tom Frieden. Tom Frieden, of course, was a CDC director, did a great job. You know, has been a, a key partner of us on polio and many other things. But now he's got a, a, a foundation funded by Chan Zuckerberg and uh, Michael Bloomberg and the Gates Foundation uh, with, uh, you know, starting off with $700 million to go out and really figure out how we can take these low-cost interventions in terms of uh, the heart disease burden and start to bring those not just to middle-income countries, but to, to all countries. So I'm very excited about that work, and uh, you know, it's, it's fantastic that now it's within reach that even with very, very modest resources, uh, you can have a significant impact. Correct. Final question, please. Hello, Hara Bokar. Uh, I'm a senior at the University of Washington, and my question is two-part um, about polio eradication. So the first is, how does the foundation handle transparency around the politics of this issue internally and externally? And secondly, um, I believe representational leadership is very important. Why is it that there is no representation from Pakistan or Afghanistan in the leadership initiative within the foundation? Thank you. Did you hear? Okay, okay. So the second thing is, why are there no women in the polio team? Or? Uh, representation from Pakistan and Afghanistan, where polio is still uh, uh, being eradicated, why isn't there representation from there within the leadership initiative? From Pakistan and Afghanistan. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, the foundation has lots of great uh, Pakistani doctors. I don't know if we have Afghanistan doctors, but, uh, you know, like... Uh, uh, Anita Zaidi, who runs our diarrheal group, is an amazing uh, Pakistani doctor. When we, when we created our, our polio team, we didn't know what the last country would be. Uh, with smallpox, it was Somalia, uh, but we didn't put any Somalians on our, our polio team. Uh, and anticipating that, it's amazing to us, it should have been India, should have been the last country, uh, because we, at least we thought it would be, because it was always, literally until 2009, the majority of polio cases were in India. And then in 2011, we finally, it was going back and forth between Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. There'd be a lot of cases in, in UP, we'd knock that down. And then migrant uh, people uh, up on the Kosi River, you know, would come down, we'd get reinfection, and we thought we'd never get there. It was, a lot of the funders withdrew, we doubled our, our funding. So that was a huge milestone in 2011. Everyone thought that Pakistan would be a lot like India. The children move around uh, less, but because of various Taliban areas, uh, mm -hmm. it's turned out to be very difficult. Now, you know, I just met with the, the new prime minister. We actually did a, a polio, we do uh, very regular polio reviews. We're very much on, on top of, of that one. Um, what was the, the first part of the question? Did you understand? C could you quickly just restate your, your first point? Um, transparency around the politics uh, for managing the eradication efforts in countries like Pakistan and Afghanistan where uh, there are areas of Taliban. 
their areas of well, yeah. hey, uh, and there's no there's no secrets in the polio game. Uh, you know, the genetics of every bi virus are sequenced and published. Uh, the we the, our best uh, thing today is environmental samples. Actual cases, it, it's a very tough disease because you only see the acute flaccid paralysis after the kids uh, suffered from it, and so a few weeks after they were infected. Then you take stool samples and you verify, because there's lots of other causes of the acute uh, uh, flaccid paralysis, and then finally you see. So you're way past the time of the infection. And with polio, uh, there's over a hundred infections where people don't get paralyzed for every one where they do get paralyzed. And so the disease can move silently with those asymptomatics, huge distances and huge periods of time. And so when we track virus, we can actually look at the clock because of the mutations. We have virus that, that goes hidden for a year and then pops up somewhere. So unlike smallpox, where you could say to people, hey, if you see this characteristic rash, if you find somebody like that, we'll give you a reward. Uh, we have to have tracking and paralysis, and it's a very uh, muted signal. So the signal that's most useful to us now is kind of this amazing thing, which is if you trawl through sewage with the right diagnostic, you can actually find poliovirus. So we go in, um, and in Pakistan, <coughs> Afghanistan, we have 50 locations we're doing environmental samples. And so that's uh, much lower latency and far more accurate. And unfortunately, we, and we publish all this, we still, in Ketablok, uh, Baluchistan, we see lots of positive environmental samples in parts of Karachi. Peshawar was clear for six months. Now we have positive environmental samples. Over in Afghanistan, all the environmental samples are clear. So. You know, we, we look at the genetic lineages, we look at the environmental samples, uh, and yes, our problem is Taliban. Taliban, uh, you know, has gone and murdered the women who go out and deliver these vaccines. Less so in the last six months. In Afghanistan, the Taliban's way better. They actually allow the vaccines to go in, so they don't create inaccessibility. Now, making sure the quality is good, we've had to uh, work hard on that, but there, there's a cooperative effort. In parts of Pakistan, uh, you know, historically uh, up in the Fada area, we had too many children who weren't covered, and it was when the army went in there that then we actually had a surge of cases, of course, because they started mixing with the other kids, but that's what really gave us a chance to succeed. And, you know, so between the understanding where people are moving with satellite imagery and the environmental samples and a very close relationship, I just saw uh, President Ghani and uh, the, prime, the Pakistani Prime Minister last week uh, to talk through what we need to do better, what the quality measures are telling us. And that, of the three areas, the Syria and Nigeria, that one I think it, it's most clearly on track for this low season with any luck uh, to be the first low season where we will see absolutely zero cases. Well, this last answer just illustrated that in addition to provided very significant financial support, your depth of understanding of the actual mm -hmm. scientific, technological, political <laughs> issues is just completely extraordinary. So thank you so much, Bill. Thank you. Great. Good thank time. you. Very nice to, to have you here. And thank you for all thank of you. you. All right. Outstanding.